Again, thank you to everyone who has joined us today for this session of the North Central Farm and Ranch Stress Assistance Center webinar series presented to you by the National Agribility Project. My name is Paul Jones. I manage the National Agribility Project, which is headquartered at Purdue University. And our topic today is on strategies for preventing farm and ranch suicides and for assisting those left behind. Our presenter today is Darla Tyler McSherry, and she's from the organization called Ask in Earnest. Just a little background on the uh, Farm and Ranch Stress Assistance, Assistance Network, which is typically known as FARSAN. It was first authorized in the 2008 Farm Bill. And the purpose is to provide stress assistance programs to people engaged in agriculture um, who are, are dealing with stress issues. There are four regional centers that cover every state in the United States and the territories. And if you'd like contact information for those centers, please feel free to check out the agribility.org website under the resources link. And then there is a specific link for the Farm and Ranch Stress Assistance Network. For those who are not familiar with Agribility, we are sponsored by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Our focus is on assisting people in agriculture that have some type of disability or functional limitation. Every one of the Agribility projects around the country is uh, led by a land-grant university, and they are required to partner with at least one nonprofit disability services organization. Currently, there are 21 state projects around the country, plus the national project, again, led through Purdue University at our Breaking New Ground Resource Center. And our partners on that grant include Goodwill of the Finger Lakes, the Osteoarthritis Action Alliance, AgriSafe Network, Colorado State University, and Washington State University. Again, feel free to check out agribility.org for a wealth of resources, including more than 130 archive webinars on a wide variety of topics. Again, our presenter today is Darla Tyler McSherry. She is the founder and visionary of Ask in, Ir in Earnest, which is an initiative that is designed to address mental health, depression, and suicide in the farm and ranch populations. She embraces the role of serving as an agent of positive change and advocacy for the farm and ranch populations. Darla has bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Montana in health and human performance. She's been involved with college health for more than 27 years and is currently the Director of Student Health Services at Montana State Billings. Uh, she serves in various capacities with the American College Health Association and the Rocky Mountain College Health Association. In addition, uh, she is the coordinator of the Yellowstone County DUI Task Force. At this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and invite Darla to share hers for the body of the presentation. Thank you, Paul. Okay, great. Thank you so much for your help. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for letting me have some time with you today. Um, as Paul said, my name is Darla, and um, I'm just very appreciative that you're taking the time today to um, talk with us ab about this important project. Um, and, and quoting Teddy Roosevelt from a speech he gave in 1910, um, I'm really honored to be spending time with people who are in the arena, um, your, whose faces are marred by dust and sweat and blood. And I want to come back to that at the very end, um, but I'm, I'm just very appreciative of what you do day in and day out on the farm, on the ranch, or if you're working with farmers and ranchers to address such an important um, topic. I used to believe that suicide was this terrible, awful, tragic event that happened to other people. And that all changed for me in September 30th, 2016. My dad, Dick Tyler, a third generation Montana wheat farmer, um, took his own life on that day. My dad was born on the farm. My brother and I were raised in the farmhouse that he was born in because my, my grandparents didn't have enough money to go to the hospital. He was born in the middle of the depression. Um, and so my dad was born on the farm and he died on the farm at his own hands. 
In the days after his suicide, I was talking with one of his friends and his friend said this, when your dad was in town walking down the street and he saw you, he would stop and he would ask in earnest how you were doing. And he wasn't doing it to be nosy or gossipy. He just really cared about how you and your family were doing. And it's one of the most beautiful things that anyone has ever said to me about my dad. And it's very true. So this is the message that I want to share with you today. So what we want to do, what are we're, the topics that we're going to cover is what do we know about farming and suicide? We're going to take a look at that data. We're going to also spend some time about risk factors that might be unique to that farm and ranch population that place us more at risk for suicide. Let's talk about those harmful suicide myths that allow suicide to continue to be so pervasive. And also, what are some action steps that we can take daily on the farm, on the ranch to help protect those around us and ourselves? and then assisting those left behind, how to help those family members and those loved ones who are left behind after suicide. So um, as you saw in my bio, I do work full-time at other jobs, but um, this past summer, here is my office for a couple of weeks. Um, after, uh, for most of my adult life, my dad and my brother handled the wheat harvest. And um, after my dad passed, my, one of our cousins helped out my brother. And he wasn't able to, to help this year, so I stepped in. So I was the cook and the truck driver. And for those of you who are looking at that tractor, that was um, purchased by my grandfather in 1951. And the, the technology just amazes me because I don't even know how that works, but it starts on gas and then it switches over to diesel. So my brother would just start it and I would just cross my fingers each day that I wouldn't idle, idle it up too much or idle it down too little that I would hurt it or, or make it stop running. Um, and also my, my brother was very gracious and he was supportive of me coming home to help. I think he might've been a little bit nervous about a couple of things. He says, well, if the grain bin starts to get full, let me know and I'll come in and we'll, we'll move the auger over to the next grain bin. So I snapped this picture and I ran up to the combine and I said, that's pretty full, right? And he looked at that and he says, yeah, that's full. Don't try to put any more. Don't try to, try to put any more into it. Um, and so then um, there's my brother out in the combine. Um, as with most of the country this year, we had just a very significant drought, battled grasshoppers, battled hailstorms. You know, some of the, the local Farmers didn't even take their combines out of the shed to even try to cut a crop this year. Um, he, he was fortunate enough that he was able to get a, an okay crop. And then um, just one other photo, farmers always love rain, except at harvest time, right? So as you can see, just straight west of the farm, a rain shower came through and, and kept us out of the field for, for about a day. So um, I shared that with you because um, even though I don't um, spend my day-to-day -day life in agriculture, I'm very supportive of it. That's how my brother makes his living. That's where I come from. Um, and you are my people. And I want to advocate for you and for us so that we can all be healthy and thriving and prevent this awful tragedy of suicide. So what do we know about the data? The CDC re released a report in 2016 and said that of the occupations um, that they studied farming, which includes farming, ranching, fishing, and forestry, um, that is the number one occupation per suicide, for suicides. And then a little while later, they came out and they said, oh, there's some data flaws. We have to rework the data. And what they found is that they had, some, they had it categorized in odd ways. And when they reshuffled or reorganized that data, they found that if farmers, ranchers, and ag managers were given their own group, they would have ranked number one for suicide in 2012 and 2015. Another report came out in 2020, which also showed that farmers are among the most likely to die by suicide. And obviously, it's never a category that anyone wants to be number one in. 
we know that the rural suicide rate is 45% higher than the urban suicide rate. The suicide increase from 1999 to 2019 nationwide was 33%. In Montana, that was 38%. Montana has been in the top five or the number one state for suicide in the past 40 years. Recent preliminary data has come out and is suggesting that there is a national downward trend for some categories, for some populations, um, while it's increasing in others, uh, including young adults, so young farmers, Native Americans, Alaska Natives, Black Americans, and Hispanic Americans. So there's still so much work to be done for this topic for so many populations. Many of us recall the farm crisis back in the 1980s, and we might remember there was a lot of attention given to farm foreclosures and farmer suicides. Well, wasn't it worse back then? Actually, no. Today's the suicide rate for farmers is 50% higher than it was in the 1980s. And every 33 hours in Montana, and every 11 minutes in the United States, we lose a person to suicide. And tragically, this is not only a problem for American farmers. In Australia, the suicide rate is double in rural areas than in urban areas. The United Kingdom has farming as one of the highest rates of suicide for any occupation. In France, the suicide rate in dairy farmers is 50% higher than the national average. And in India, hundreds of thousands of farmers have died in the past 30 years from suicide. We know that one suicide impacts nearly 150 people and even more so in rural communities because of those strong social bonds and that ripple effect that has such a broader, wider ranging reach than um, in urban areas. So we need to take action now to save lives. So let's look at some of those risk factors that are unique to farm stress. One of the, the top things that uh, we don't unfortunately have much control over is just how unpredictable farming and ranching is because of bad weather. My brother and his, his neighbors, his friends are dealing with heavy, significant, severe winds in North Central Montana today. Um, and as I shared earlier, as many of you did, went through a severe drought this summer and it's almost December one and it's 60 degrees and we don't have any snow. Disease outbreaks, whether that's livestock or crop, um, health issues, whether you're for yourself or for a person on your team. Um, most small farms have a small number of employees or workers. So if one person goes out, that puts a significant workload onto the others around them. And then other predictability um, and other issues that are unpredictable, such as market prices, equipment, supply costs, and then also relationships. Um, in farm and ranch, it's not unusual to have um, coworkers also be your family members. Your, your boss may also be your parent. Your siblings could also be co-owners of an organization or a corporation. Um, Mike Roseman, who I'll talk about more in the next slide, has said most agrarian people know how to work hard, but less about managing behavior and, and relationships. It's not in agricultural curricula. Um, Mike Roseman, some of you are probably familiar with him, is just a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful human being. Um, he is a farmer and he's also a psycholo psychologist in, in Iowa. And he has spent his life devoted to addressing mental health and farmers. And he has developed what's called the agrarian imperative. And it reads, like many animal species, humans have a basic need to acquire sufficient territory and the necessary resources, such as capital, buildings, livestock, to produce the food and shelter required by their families and communities. Also called the agrarian imperative, this genetically programmed instinct drives farmers to hang on to their land at all costs. The agrarian imperative instills farmers to work incredibly hard, to tolerate unusual pain and adversity, to trust their own judgment, and to take uncommon risks. So you can see by looking at that, all those things, those factors, those, those qualities of what makes a farmer successful 
can actually work against him when it comes to mental health, um, depression, and risk of suicide. So uh, these next risk factors aren't necessarily, um, I wanna just clarify that um, all these risk factors are not necessarily associated with being a farmer and rancher, but many of these certainly apply. One of those is the work-life balance or an imbalance. Um, if I have a rotten day at work and it's just been rotten from start to finish, at the end of my workday, I get to leave my work site and go home and just switch gears physically as well as mentally. You don't have that luxury on your farm or on your ranch. You can look out the window and you see the fact that it hasn't rained or the fact that it hasn't stopped raining. And you have these chores to do and these projects. And it, it can be hard mentally to shut off your brain from working and focus on life outside of work. And for a lot of farmers and ranchers, it's, it's all one and the same, right? Another um, risk factor is economics. Key commodity prices have dropped about 50% since 2012. Farm debt has jumped about one third since 2007 to levels last seen in the 1980s. And in 2019 alone, bad weather prevented farmers from planting nearly 20 million acres. The language and the, the culture of farming um, is also a risk factor. And I'm going to use a story about my dad. So I was in high school and my dad and my brother were out harvesting and my mom and I were in the house and it, my dad um, was cutting barley at the time. And for those of you who grow barley, you know what happens if you cut it a little bit too soon in the morning. It's a little too damp, right? It doesn't auger off very well. It gets a little sticky. So my brother was at the grain bins augering off one of the other trucks and the other truck was out in the field. So my dad could keep going on the combine and, and just dump into that truck sitting out in the field. So my dad is unloading and, and the barley isn't augering off very well. So what does he do? He gets out of the cab, crawls up into the combine tank while the auger is still running and starts kicking the barley around to help it get out through the auger. Momentarily, he gets his foot caught in the auger and he's able to jerk it out, crawled up out of the, out of the tank, got back in the cab, slammed the combine into the gear and took off. And he told us later on, he said, yeah, I, I had to really grip onto that steering wheel really tight a couple of times. I thought I was going to pass out. Um, and he also said at the time he wore cowboy boots and he looked down at his boot and he saw blood coming out of it. And he just looked up and kept going. Um, so he was able to tolerate, tolerate that for a while, but it got to be too much. So they, they shut down and they came into the house. And my dad said to my mom, I'm hurt. I need help. Of course, that's what he would say, right? I'm hurting. I need help. That's a reasonable, rational, appropriate response when you need care. Fast forward 35 years later, when my dad was having these thoughts about his life, his situation, he, he was, had to have been thinking the only way out was to take his own life. He didn't have that language in him. And we don't make it easy for men in our society to say, I'm hurting mentally or I'm hurting psychologically. I need help. Exposure to pesticides, farm chemicals, brain dust can place us at risk because of the neurological imbalances that that can create and also a limited oxygen uptake. And we know if our brains aren't getting enough oxygen, it's hard to make good decisions. We have cloudy judgment, poor thinking. And stigma can be a huge factor in rural areas. Most of us really don't have any issues sharing with friends, neighbors, well, I have a dentist appointment or I have a doctor's appointment. Um, it can be different for people to say, I have an appointment go talk to my counselor. Trauma history. So for people who have lost a significant other, who've been exposed to natural disasters or have experienced some sort of interpersonal violence, can be more at risk. And a lack of or a reluctance to seek um, mental health services because they're, they're few and far in between in rural areas for sure. 
Other risk factors um, could be uh, using alcohol as a coping strategy. Here in Montana specifically, um, the blood alcohol content at the time of death is two times that of the national average. Also having access to lethal means. Um, farmers, ranchers just naturally have access to lots of ways to, to harm themselves, to kill themselves, um, whether it's firearms or um, poisons or, or machinery. Here in Montana, we're the second highest state in the nation for gun ownership. Um, in Montana, um, uh, suicides um, are, or you see firearms involved in uh, almost two thirds of all of our suicides. Um, nationwide firearms are used in about half of all suicides. A lack of vitamin D. Um, it's been shown that if there's a low blood level of vitamin D, um, there's an increase in depression. And a lot of us live in the Northern hemisphere, right? And I was just making a comment to a friend yesterday. It's like, oh my gosh, you get up in the dark, you go to work, it's been cloudy and overcast lately. You leave work, it's dark. Um, so we're just more at risk just from the fact of where we live. Also high altitude. Worldwide, we see that suicides increase at elevations of 2,500 feet or more. Here in Montana, the average elevation for suicide is 3,500 feet, and the average elevation in Montana is 3,400 feet. Mental illness. Um, it's estimated that up to 90% of those who die from suicide suffer from an undiagnosed and untreated mental illness, the number one being depression, the number two being alcoholism. A University of Illinois study conducted in 2018 um, surveyed 170 young farmers and found that 53% of them reported mild to severe um, signs of depression. Anxiety and stress regarding climate change. I put this in here. It's, it's new data, but I think it's certainly noteworthy and it's something that we need to address and pay attention to. A study from Montana State University um, found that of 100, 125 Montana farmers, 70% agree that climate change is having an impact on their business, and nearly three quarters of them are experiencing moderate to high levels of anxiety when thinking about climate change and its effects on, on their agricultural business. And then finally, farmers and ranchers have to deal with the crushing loneliness of social isolation. Um, I know um, uh, we've got folks joining us from, from all over the nation um, um, for, for this webinar and your population might look a little bit different, but here in Montana, um, we're, we're, we're isolated. There's just not that many of us out here. Um, the national average for the United States is um, 88 people per square mile. And if you're like me, you think, uh, oh my gosh, that's just too many people, right? Um, here in Yellowstone County, um, where I currently live, the most populous county in Montana, we're only at 60 people per square mile. Um, there's 10 counties in Montana, the, the ones that are in dark red that have less than one person per square mile. And where I grew up, Shoto County has 1.5 people per square mile. So there's lots of risk factors involved, right? So now let's talk about harmful suicide myths. Suicide thrives in darkness, in secrecy, in not talking about it. And we have to address these myths head on to help address this problem. First one is that most suicides happen without warning. But what we find out is somewhere around 70 to 80% of people that we've lost to suicide did display some warning signs, um, but unfortunately those were missed. And I wanna be very careful and just very respectful because I, I, I'm, I don't say that in any kind of blaming way because I get it. I know what it feels like to, to hear that. Um, so please understand it and how that is, is meant. Another myth is that people who die by suicide are selfish and take the easy way out. Whereas in reality, their sense of truth and their judgment is distorted by this heavy cloud, this heavy filter of pain 
and they just have impaired thinking. They are truly not themselves um, at that moment. Another myth is like, well, once someone is suicidal, they will always be suicidal. And that's just not true. Studies have been done uh, with people who survived their own suicide attempt. And up to 90% don't go on to make another attempt if they get the help they need, oftentimes in the form of mental health counseling and medications. Here's a really big one I hear a lot of, well, talking about it causes it. Well, I'm worried about this person, but if I bring up the topic of suicide, that, that might plant that idea in their head, and, and I don't want to do that. That has never been shown to ever, ever have been true. If we really care about someone and we approach them and we ask them, are you thinking about suicide? What often happens is we get such a sense of relief from that other person, because finally someone understands me, someone is noticing I'm struggling, someone cares. Um, do not ever worry about bringing up that topic. It's gonna plant that seed um, for someone. And then lastly, a, a very harmful myth, and I think this is so true with our, our farm population, is you know, strong people don't kill themselves. I think my dad is probably the strongest person I ever knew. He's, he endured a lot in his 82 years of being alive. Um, we really have to change that language. And, and we're, we're doing that today. We're all working on this together, right? Um, that harmful lens of, of how we view mental health. Like, well, just suck it up. Just go work harder. Just get over it. Um, we would never say that to someone who's battling cancer. Like, you know, just get over your cancer. Um, or just get over your, your dislocated, dislocated shoulder. Um, yeah, we just have to be more aware of that language. So here's some, uh, again, some action steps that we can take to save lives. Again, as, you know, first thing we can do is educate ourselves about what to look for, right? And again, up to 80% will display warning signs that are missed. So we want to pay attention to the words that a person is saying um, the big three, they talk about being a burden, whether it's the burden of themselves, maybe for some reason they're losing independence or they, they can't take care of themselves like they used to, or they're worried about a burden um, that they, that they are um, bringing to the family um, with whatever is going on in the farm. Um, they talk about a loss of hope. They, they would say things like, um, nothing that I do works anymore, or it's no use, there's no hope. And also, they, they don't see a future for themselves. They may say things like, you know, I just can't do this anymore. Also, pay attention to their moods. If they seem depressed, or anxious, or shameful, or irritable, they have a loss of interest in the activities that they really used to love. Um, if they're angry, um, if they're verbalizing the things such as, well, nothing is fun anymore, or I haven't laughed for weeks, or if they're making dramatic threats such as, well, I'm going to shoot all my cows before I let the courts have them. Those are things that we have to pay attention to. Also, we need to be very um, aware if all of a sudden there's a sudden improvement in a person that we've been worried about coming out of suicidal thoughts, coming out of suicidal, out of depression takes some time. So with a person all of a sudden seems like so much better, what really might be going on is that they've been wrestling with this decision of whether or not they should take their own lives and they've made up their mind that they're going to. And it's not really happiness that they're expressing, it's just a sense of relief. And what kind of actions are they displaying? Are they um, acquiring more access to lethal means? And again, farmers and ranchers have lots of ways to take their own lives, but are they, are they doing um, collecting more guns or, or are they collecting pills, things of that nature? Again, if, if they're, they seem like they're angry, they're expressing anger. Um, and also, or, and or they're withdrawing, they're isolating themselves from friends, from families. Um, fatigue can be assigned to. So here's the, the, the crux of Ask and Earnest of um, what I promote, what I advocate is to see from the 30,000 foot view. 
Um, in terms of my dad, I think all of us were just so close. Like it was just right here, right front and center that had we had the ability to zoom out, um, you know, maybe things would have been different. So when I say to you, see from the 30,000 foot view, um, are they doing things such as avoiding public events? They're avoiding the high school basketball games they used to be at all the time, or are they avoiding the, the church um, Sunday dinners, that kind of thing? Um, what is their affect like? Are they pretty flat? You don't see a lot of expression on their faces. You don't see a lot of emotion coming out of them. Retreating behaviors, isolation. Um, is there a deterioration in, in their physical appearance or is the farmstead itself suffering? Um, what, do, what do their crops look like? What does the health of their livestock look like? If those are all going down um, and that's really not normal for that person, um, it's, it's definitely time to, to have a conversation and potentially intervene. Also see from the 30,000 foot view, what else is going on for that person? Is it tax season? Is it loan repayment time? Um, anecdotally, if it's um, seeding time or if it's harvest time, that's that can be a high risk time for farmers. They don't they don't have that ability. They don't have that energy. They don't have the will to start a whole nother season, um, as was you know, pretty much the case with my dad. We need to listen a little bit differently. We need to listen to what isn't being said. Um, they also may take the talk about um, there's a lump in my throat phenomenon, or I feel like I could cry, but I can't. And also if they talk about an inability to sleep or have a very limited sleep, that's a huge red flag. We have to be willing to ask the hard questions. The word suicide to me is an awful word. I hate that word coming out of my mouth, but we have to use it. If we're worried about someone, we have to be um, strong ourselves. And to me, um, strong and vulnerable are not opposites. Together, to me, they're very much intertwined and one and the same. We have to gear ourselves up and, and have this potentially life-saving conversation with this person we have to be really strong and really lay things out on the line ourselves with the hope and, and really the expectation that, that we want that person to do the same thing. We have to be direct. Um, we have to say, are you thinking of suicide? Are you thinking of killing yourself? And we have to steal ourselves. And I think this is really true for, for women because women, what do we do? We spend so much of our time wanting our men to talk to us, whether it's our dads, our husbands, our brothers, our sons. If we ask that question, we have to be ready to hear something come out of the mouths of someone that we love that's very, very difficult to hear. How you ask can also make a difference. So if you were to say to me, Darla, are you thinking about suicide? That would maybe prompt a conversation. I would feel like you really care and you want to know what's going on inside of me and you want to help versus, well, Darla, you're not thinking about suicide, are you? To me, I would probably, that would be sending a message like you really don't want to hear what's going on and you don't know what to do. So I might be inclined to say, no, everything's fine. Um, but the most important thing I want you to, to understand is the worst thing that we can say about suicide is nothing at all. Also, the more plans or the more details a person may have about their suicide, the more urgent it is to get them immediate help. Um, have they thought about how they would kill themselves? Have they acquired the means to do so? Have they thought about when or where they would do it? Um, again, the more planned out, the more detailed that is, um, the more immediate help that is needed. Um, and just one other note about, um, again, addressing the culture of farming and ranching. It's a very proud culture. I understand that. I was born and raised in it. Um, I think that we also need to really remember, um, quoting Michael Stanier, He's an author who wrote the book, Do More Great Work, and he says this, men carry the burden of being strong and never weak 
and we all pay the price for it. So here's another thing. Um, the next steps that we can do to help save lives is we want to restrict access to lethal means. So we want to put time and distance between suicidal thoughts and actions, okay? As I shared with you earlier in Montana, two out of three suicides involve the use of a gun. Half of the suicides in the U.S. involve the use of a gun. Um, this is not a conversation about gun control. It's about saving lives. Um, so that conversation, you know, it might sound something like this, and you would need to find the words and, and the language that's comfortable for you. But if I had a friend, Tom, and I was really worried about Tom, I might say something like, you know, Tom, I'm, I'm really worried about you. You've, you've talked about how you're thinking about suicide, and I need you to stay alive. I want to help. How about I babysit your guns and your ammo, and let's get you some help, and when you're feeling better, you can have them back. Um, share your concerns. This is too big of a topic for us to try to take on ourselves. Get other folks involved. Um, and also with this is... Um, we may have that feeling of, well, they're seeing their doctor. That's great. We may think, oh, problem solved. They're seeing the doctor. Everything's fine. Um, the reality shows that's not true. Um, up to 45% of individuals who die by suicide see their primary care provider within one month of their death. Um, and another 20% 20 do so within 24 hours. Um, and I understand, I get it. There's a difference between primary care and, and emergency room care. But in the case of my dad, um, my dad was in the ER uh, on a Tuesday. They turned him around and sent him home. He was back in the ER on Thursday. They turned him around and sent him home and he was dead on Friday. So there's still a lot of work that needs to happen, not only for lay people such as us, or I'm assuming most of us are lay people without professional medical, mental health counseling training, um, but just more work needs to be done. So taking action, what can we do? We can call this National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK or 911-TALK. Also, a great strategy I had never thought of before, and it may sound like a no-brainer to you, but it was a revelation for me. When I heard another speaker say, you know, if you're really worried about someone and you don't know what to do, you can call the suicide prevention hotline for yourself. Okay. Whereas I used to think, well, we want this person to call that suicide prevention hotline. You call them, them you can call them yourself and get great help, great strategies from trained people on the other end of that line. This is really exciting. Beginning July of this coming summer, there's a national launching of 988 for mental health emergencies. You can text the National Crisis Text Line at 741-741. You can go to your local emergency room, help them connect, follow up and advocate. We can also bring um, trainings to our community, um, such as gatekeeper trainings, um, one of those well-known trainings is QPR, which is question, persuade, and refer. And you can think of QPR as CPR for suicide. Um, it's about a 60 to a 90-minute class. It guides you. It teaches you skills and confidence how to have those really intense conversations with people about suicide and, and boost up your confidence and, and you feel more skilled and, and capable to have those conversations. Um, and now QPR for Farmers is available too. You can access those trainings by contacting your county health department or your county extension office. Um, excuse me, who in your community can champion these efforts? Is it a local church group? Is it your volunteer fire or ambulance crew? Is it a neighborhood group? Or is it you yourself? I love this photo. What does that look like? That looks like a that looks like a room full of farmers, right? And it's true. And um, as you might remember from earlier in the presentation, um, Australia has a terrible problem with farmer suicide. So one thing that they're doing to address that, that is they'll send trained mental health professionals out to remote parts of Australia, such as driving 11 hours to get to a town of 2,000 people. 
and it's a two night program. The first night they bring all the men together and they get the men talking about what's stressing you, what's keeping you from sleeping, what is worrying you. Um, and they get to talking and, and they find that they're not alone in their struggles, that they too have the same concerns as their friends, their neighbors. And also from this converse, conversation, they learn different strategies. They get ideas from other folks. They, they, it's very supportive and it gives them some concrete tools to, to walk away with. Night two, they, they have the farmers come back and then they also bring the wives and the girlfriends and they can participate too. Um, and it's just very, very um, unique and it's grassroots level um, efforts. And these mental health professionals have just been so blown away by the efforts of people in these rural areas where they've learned that an entire town will go on a suicide watch to help make sure that this one person stays alive because they're just tired of suicide and they want that to end. Here, uh, more in the U.S., there's a couple other grass, grassroots organizations um, launched. One is TUGS, and that stands for Talking, Understanding, Growing, and Supporting. And that's a nonprofit community organization founded in 2013 with a singular mission to address the stigma surrounding mental health challenges and suicide, particular, particularly among those members of our society who find it most difficult to accept and express their real personal struggles and professional um, frustrations. And another organization is known as the Farmer Angel Network. Um, and this was born out of a response to a dairy farmer's suicide in Wisconsin. Um, it's a grassroots organization dedicated to help farmers overcome the mental challenges associated with farming. We talk about different topics to help see these guys through the tough times. Those tough times, unfortunately, affected one of my neighbors so badly that he took his own life. And another important thing that we can do is just bring mental health just into our daily conversations to help normalize this. Um, this next slide has a video. Um, it's one minute long, and um, we'll, we'll talk about that um, afterwards. And if you get teary, I, I totally understand because when I saw it the very first time, um, I just cried. Jim. Hey, Pete, how you doing? That's the day Jim saved my life. I tried ending it all once before. Morning, well fellas. Jim wasn't going to let it happen again. Hi, Jim. stopped showing up, Jim showed up at my door. He didn't let me brush him off, and he took me to the hospital in town to get me help. Everyone has a role in preventing suicide. Know the warning signs and rock your role. If someone you know is in crisis or emotional distress, call the Idaho Suicide Prevention Hotline at 208 398 help. And our, our friends over at the Idaho Suicide Prevention Coalition were, were gracious enough to let us um, share that with um, share that with us. And we've been able to put our own logo on that. So they've been very gracious. And I want to acknowledge that. Um, I think that's just so wonderful. And what did Jim do? Jim, he wasn't a superhuman. He didn't try to train himself to become a counselor. Jim was just his friend and he showed up um, and he didn't let him brush him off. And I think it's, I think it's just beautiful. So um, I know we're kind of coming up on the end of time, but so I'll go through these next slides um, and uh, I'll be just cognizant of the time is that self-care is also a really important strategy in preventing suicide. And why do we want to spend time talking about this? Because all of these strategies help combat depression. If you remember earlier on, up to 90% of people who die from suicide have undiagnosed, untreated depression. So making sure that we sleep well, our sleep environment is dark and it's quiet and 
um, blue lights from our cell phones or from our DVD players or what have you are all darkened as much as possible because those can disrupt our sleep cycles. Having a room that is slightly more humid than a dry, stuffy room is going to let us sleep better. Um, and uh, just make a routine that the last 30 minutes to last 60 minutes, whenever you can, before bedtime, you are unwinding. So as your body unwinds, your mind can unwind and same is true vice versa. Nutrition is also very important. Um, a body that is continually stressed is more prone to depression. And it's been shown that a poor quality diet, so one that's high in a lot of processed foods, a lot of sweets, a lot of fried foods, refined cereals, that kind of thing, we're more likely to report symptoms of depression versus people who ate more leaner cuts of meat, have more complex carbohydrates, a wide variety of fruits and vegetables. Um, and it's also important that you nourish, think about nourishing and hydrating your body with the same attention and care that you do for your crops and for your livestock. And exercise, I am such a huge advocate of exercise as the best free antidepressant out there. So when I talk about exercise, I mean walking or running or an exercise bike or dancing. Um, if we can try to get 20 to 30 minutes on most days of the week, or if we can accumulate about an hour a day, that's even better because exercise positively impacts brain chemistry. Okay. And then stress management um, on the Northern, on the North Central um, website, there's this great um, handout from North Dakota State University Extension Office, I believe. It's a great handout. It's one pager about, you know, just daily stress management on the farm. Do you take 10 minutes the night before and plan out the next day? Um, how are you going to structure work versus life outside of work, sleep, et cetera, et cetera? That's a great handout if you haven't checked that out yet. And then one other thing is just, you know, continue to educate yourself on the issue of depression and suicide. Um, just a couple of those that I want to point out is the Farm Aid Call Center has individuals who came from either um, a rural background or they're trained in rural issues um, that can help people in times of crisis. Also, another one that I need to dig around more on, but isn't very intriguing, is the National Center for Farm health out of Australia, and of course, the North Central Farm and Ranch Stress Assistance Center. Um, that picture is, is so impactful for me because that's the last picture I have of, of my family intact that was taken about a year before my dad died. And it was just a beautiful late summer um, evening, and I had gone up to the farm for the weekend, and we had supper in Loma, and it was just too nice of a night to just go home. So we went down to the footbridge in Fort Benton and, and just had you know, those idyllic family times. It was just a good evening. Um, so how can we assist those who are left behind is, is really important, right? Because that can be really overwhelming. You, you don't know where to start. And you don't know what to do. Um, just understand the uniqueness of suicide grief and that um, that can come with a lot of guilt or a lot of fear blame and anger and shame that might not be there with, with other ways that we lose folks. Ask how you can help. Um, what's needing to be done right away um, or at least short term with livestock, with field work. Um, I'm still so grateful to the farmers who helped my brother out when my dad died they just stepped in and my brother put one person in charge and they said, Randall, just go do what you need to do. We're going to get the rest of your fall, fall seeding done for you. Um, and I could just see the relief just come all over my brother's face and out of his, his body that he could just focus on, on, on grieving and just helping us make all the plans with the memorial service and whatnot. Um, what are the chores or projects need to be done? Maybe it's just helping with laundry or bringing over a meal. Um, who can be the organizer? Who can delegate? Who can volunteer to just really help out that family in time of need? Understand that telling the story is part of the healing. Um, we might have to tell that story over and over. And the best thing that you can do is just listen and listen without judgment. 
um, and listen without trying to make anything better because you can't. Just being there and just showing up is what is most important. Realize the intensity of the grief from a suicide loss can come in waves. Um, and just to just know that it's, you know, someone gave me great advice one time and they said that grief is not linear. Um, and that's true for any kind of loss, any kind of death, but especially with suicide. Say, say our loved ones' names, share stories about them, a funny story or something that you liked or that you admired about that person. Those are literally nuggets of gold for us. And they're so valuable and they're so important. Um, don't be afraid to say their names. Trust me, we, we don't forget that that person isn't here anymore. Loved ones left behind are at more risk for suicide themselves. So be sure to check in on them. Are you eating? Are you sleeping? Um, um, how are you doing? And just listen and be supportive and know how to get them connected to help if needed. And then um, realize the unique potential triggers. And I'll share a quick story. Um, so some time had passed um, after my dad had died and my mom started to go through some of his clothing. Um, and so we all took pieces that were meaningful to us. And um, she had planned to donate um, a lot of the other things. And all of us, or many of us have kind of our special item of clothing, right? For some women, we really like shoes. Um, some men really like um, belt buckles or maybe it's a cowboy hat or some women uh, purses are our things. And for my dad, it was coats. He had really unique, bright, vivid colors of coats. They're coats. They were pretty distinctive. So I was up at the farm. My mom came to me. She had this very intense look on her face and it, it just almost just made me step back because it was so intense. She had a stack of coats, my dad's coats in her arms and she gave them to me. And she said, here, take these down to Billings and donate them down there. I don't wanna be walking in the mall and have her and see some other man where am I wearing my husband's coat. And even just, just remembering that memory is extremely hard because that's things that we have to think about in rural areas, right? That maybe other folks don't think about in urban areas. So there's um, some of my resources that I used in developing this presentation. Um, and in this last slide, um, remember at the beginning, I said I'm honored to be here with people whose faces are marred by blood and sweat and dirt. Um, this is from Teddy Roosevelt um, from his speech uh, to, in 1910, citizens, Citizenship in a Republic. He said, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but those who, but who does actually strive to do the deeds who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of great achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly. So in closing, I'd like to say to you, please dare greatly and ask in earnest, and you may save a life. Um, please check out my website. It's askinearnest.org. And um, you can email me at askinearnest at hotmail.com. And my name is Darla, and I'm so glad I got to spend some time with you today. Thank you. Darla, thank you, Darla, so, thank much you so much for that excellent presentation. We, we know it's a difficult topic. We appreciate you sharing your personal experiences and all the research you've gathered and, and of course, all the resources you shared that are, are useful to to anybody out there that's that's dealing with uh, farmers, ranchers, um, anybody in any industry, really. Uh, we have uh, just a couple minutes left, but we will hang around. And um, if you have questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. And please don't forget to um, fill out our very brief survey. I've put there 
uh, the link in a couple times. I just put it in again. If you could um, please check that out. Um, there's a link to the video that, that Darla showed in the uh, chat also. If you'd like to see that again, click on that and bookmark that. I'm going to turn things over to Chuck Baldwin to summarize any questions that have come into the chat. I'm also going to uh, allow you to unmute yourselves. Uh, if you have a question, you can go ahead and unmute and ask that. So, Chuck, you have a summary of what's been put in the chat so far? I do, Paul. Thanks. Uh, we just have two questions to this point. Darla, one person asked, how do you get a man to go to the doctor? Yeah, boy, that is a challenge, right? Um, you know, maybe just start spending um, before um, before trying to get them to go. Maybe just the conversation about what's what's their resistance or what are their what is the reluctance behind going to the doctor? Um, that might be really insightful. Maybe we learn something about the person that we hadn't really known before, um, or we could also present it as well. You know, we, if you have livestock, you know, you, you take your animal to the vet or you have the vet come out and do a checkup with them to make sure that they're healthy and everything is going on. Um, why would we not do the same um, for ourselves? Okay, thank you uh, for that. Uh, the other question is, will this slide deck presentation or PowerPoint be available to participants? I would like to say yes, but I guess I don't. I don't have that ability, that authority. That might be more of a Paul question. Yes, if it's okay with you, Darla, we will definitely share it on the the archives. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Those are the um, only questions. That I I, chat. Can I just go back to the question about the doctor? Yes. Um, maybe offering if, if someone went with them. Um, maybe if it's not the spouse, is it a close friend? Um, just to help. Yeah, I mean, I know. I mean, I get it. I, after my dad died, um, less than two years later, my husband passed. Um, and my husband never went to the doctor. So um, I appreciate the question. And I wish I had a good solid answer. But I think it's, I think it's a challenge that many of us women struggle with is, you know, we have to share how much we care, and we want them healthy. And and if there is something going on, let's find out what it is so we can deal with it now versus it might be really more difficult later on down the road if we're not addressing it right now. Darla, there is one more question that has come in. In working with farmers, veterans specifically, one of the barriers to care I see over and over is that they won't access care for lack of having any support to care for their farms or livestock, et cetera. Are there programs that can help support this? Hmm. That's another great question. That's something that I can look into. Um, anything that's structured or formal, I'm not aware of, um, other than the local farmers close by or friends who can help pitch in for, for a period of time. But I will do some checking into that. Um, and what I, if I'm able to find something, I'll share with Paul that maybe he can then forward out. Okay, and I think one last one at this point, and then uh, we can pass uh, any other questions on to you uh, later that uh, someone has. What is religion's role in helping suicide prevention? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, we all have a, a um, I guess, our own unique relationship um, with a higher power or God, or, or you know, people can have different um, viewpoints on that. Um, if a person um, um, is is religious, um, I think um, getting another person involved, maybe it's a local minister, or a local pastor to, to help with that process uh, might be useful. You know, I am really impressed with our local ministers back home. They have their names and phone numbers in the weekly newspaper, along with the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. Um, and I think that's really um, unique um, and important because I think there used to be a lot more kind of shame or um, sin involved as far as the conversation around suicide. Um, so they can play a huge role 
um, if that person is, you know, um, open to that idea. Okay, thank you. Paul, there have been some more questions, but I'm wondering if we need to close this at this point. I will note, it uh, looks like uh, in terms of suggestions for help for people uh, in, in regard to practical issues, uh, farm rescue has been mentioned a couple times. I know they're operative in several states in the Great Plains um, area, and uh, they, they can help with uh, behavioral mental health issues. We had a presentation from them actually yesterday for AgriBility. They mentioned that. And, uh, and then other things like uh, Farm Bureau Cattlemen's Associations might be uh, options there too. The other question I think was listed, I'll just answer quickly, is the impact of gender, female versus male farmers. Do you have any insights on that, Dar um, Not a whole lot of data specifically, other than that we, we do know that the suicide rate among females is rising. Um, and that females are starting to choose more lethal means um, of their suicide attempts. Um, so it's, it's something that we need to be paying attention to. Okay, well, thank you again, Darla, for your excellent presentation. Um, certainly revealed in the comments in the chat area, which we'll provide to you. Uh, thank you to everybody that came today. Thank you for sticking around. If you're still on the line, we will be um, hopefully uh, having another one of these webinars for the North Central Farm and Ranch Stress Assistance Center in about uh, three months, and you'll be um, notified of, of what that is and uh, when that is. So uh, again, thank you to everybody, and we wish you a good day. Thank you.